Good to see you this week. Uh, two of our series called Save the Humans. Everybody's trying to save the dolphins these days and the whales and experience life. We're just asking the question, hey, what about the humans? <laughs> like, what about us? Because the Bible says that unless humans, unless people are saved, they will spend eternity separated from God in a place called what? Hell. The Bible, the Bible says that. The Bible says that. That, that, is, that is not something I want for anybody that lives on this planet. And so, in this series, basically what we're doing is we're talking about experience life's strategy to partner with God in His strategy to save the humans. Each year when we're planning for the next year, we feel like we usually have more God ideas, ideas that God gives us, than we have money to accomplish them. And so each year we've decided to do a series like this one, share those ideas with you, and then give you the opportunity to make them a reality. And the three additional strategies we're wanting to pursue in 2011 are as follows. First, we want to make room. We want to make more room. Uh, we talked about that last weekend. You can check out the talk online on our website, experiencelifenow.com. But we want to make plenty of room, prime time hours, for you to bring family, friends, coworkers, and, and neighbors with you to church. So make room, meet needs, like more than we could do just within our budget, and minister to the world, like more than, more than normal. We want to do those things like double time. So last week, last weekend was uh, make room. This weekend we're talk, going to talk for a few minutes about why meeting needs is so important and how we plan to do it. So if you've got a Bible, let's do this. Matthew chapter 25. Matthew 25, verse 31, is on page 34, if you're in one of the blue ones, like these. If you don't have a Bible, or if it's not in a translation you understand very well, we've got some New Testaments for you in the back we'd love to give you just as a gift. You can pick one up on your way out. Page 34 in there. I'm going to read a verse, though, to you first from another uh, book of the Bible, 1 John three seventeen. then we'll get to this part. So you can write that down, though, because this is... This is uh, definitely what we're going to be talking about, very convicting. I recognize that sometimes my life doesn't align with this, and so I hope you're open uh, today for a challenge from God and that you'll be willing to repent if you need to. All right, 1 John 3, uh, verse 17 says this. It says, if someone has enough money to live well, like live well, all right? Now, now we don't really need to ask, go around the room and ask different definitions of living well because some, some people would be like, hey, I'm living well if I got two BMWs, four iPads, and I live in a 7,000 square foot home in the falls, all right? Now, 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 that may be how you define it or how somebody defines it, but according to this text, living well, it's like your basic needs are provided for. Like you got food to eat, you got clothes to wear, you got a place to stay, all right? That, that's, that's living well according to this text. So we're not talking about, you know, the falls. All right, so it says this, if someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother or sister in need but shows no compassion, all right? So you got your needs met, you got enough money to meet your own needs, you see a brother or sister or somebody that has a need, and you don't show compassion, you don't either give them money or buy them whatever they need. John asks this question, how can God's love be in that person? How can God's love be in that person? Translation, if we don't have a heart for the needy and therefore give to the needy or give to the poor, the text is saying it might appear that God's love is not in us. Oh, yeah. This is what it's saying here because this is just what Christians do. That's what Christians do. Christians are people that, that meet needs. According to the Bible, that's actually how we're recognized. At the final judgment, do you know how, how we're recognized? Let me show you. In Matthew 25, it's a long text, but you, you want to mark this down because I'm telling you, you'll probably want to refer back to it. Make sure your, li your life aligns with this. It says this is Matthew 25, 31. But when the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, He will sit upon His glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered in His presence and He will separate the people as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep at His right hand and the goats at His left. So it's talking final judgment here. The sheep that He's placing at His right are Christ's followers. People that have put their faith in Christ. The goats at his left are people that have not. All right? Verse 34. Then the king. Now, now you guys help me out. Who's, who's the king according to this text? Who's, who's this text say the king is? Jesus. He, he's, he's the king. He's the king. Then the king, Jesus, will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. Like, we want him to say that to all of us. Like, that's a good thing. That's like, hey, you're in. Like, you've made it. Like, welcome to the kingdom. Welcome to heaven. 
Why did he say that to these people on his right, the sheep on his right? Why did he say it? Here's what the text tells us. 35. This is strong. Jesus said, for I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you invited me into your home. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. Now, it's not that doing these things makes you a Christian. The Bible doesn't teach that. It just teaches that Christians do these things. Let me say that again. It's not like you go help the poor or go visit the prisoner and all of a sudden that makes me a Christian. I'm, I'm a Christian now. That's not what we're saying. But we're saying somebody who is a follower of Jesus, who has put their trust in Christ alone for salvation, will do these things. Like it's how they're recognized. It's how Jesus knew they were sheep. They were people that met needs because God's love was in their heart. 37, here, here's what they say. Well, then the righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you? Like, Jesus, we never even saw you. We would have given you something to eat, but we didn't even see you. So when did we do that? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? Or stranger and show you hospitality? Or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth. When you, listen to this, when you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. In other words, Jesus is saying what? When you helped other people, people that approached you or people that you approached, you were helping me. Thank you. You didn't realize it, but you, you were helping me as you minister to the poor among you. Verse 41. Then, and this is not good news, the king will turn to those on the left, the goats, people who have chosen not to follow Christ, and say, Away with you, you cursed ones, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his demons. Some of you are like, dang, what is he talking about? This, that sounds like hell to me. That's exactly what he's talking about. Why does he say that to the people on his left? For I was hungry and you didn't feed me. I was thirsty and you didn't give me a drink. I was a stranger and you didn't invite me into your home. I was naked and you didn't give me clothing. I was sick and in prison and you didn't visit me. Not that doing these things makes you a Christian, but Christians do these things. They were easily recognizable as people that weren't Christians because they weren't need meters. They weren't meeting needs in Jesus' name. And so Jesus knew, hey, you're not my follower then probably because that's, that's like what my followers do. That's how, that's how I can recognize them. They have my love in their heart for those that are less fortunate than themselves. Verse 46, or verse 44. Then they will reply, Lord, well, when did we ever see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and not help you? Like, hey, here's the thing, Jesus, here's the thing. I don't, I don't, we didn't remember seeing you because if we would have seen you, we would have given you a piece of bread. We would have given you, I guarantee you, we would have given it to you. And he will answer, I tell you the truth, when you refuse to help the least of these, my brothers and sisters... You were refusing to help me. Saying, hey, when people approached you and you refused to help them, you were refusing to help me. Hey, when you knew of some people that you should have approached and you didn't, hey, you were refusing to help me. Gosh. 46, and they will go away into eternal punishment. But the righteous will go into eternal life. So question. This is pretty easy. We're talking about why meeting needs is important. Why is meeting needs important? Because that's just what Christians do. Like if you're a Christ follower, if you're a Jesus follower, that's just going to come out because God's love, according to the Bible, is in you. And he loves the poor and the needy and the broken and the hurting. Why is meeting needs so important? It's just what, it's just what you do. It's just what you do because God's love has been shed abroad in your heart. So here's the questions then. That logically follows for you and for me. When's the last time you fed the hungry or gave drink to the thirsty? When's the last time you sheltered the homeless or bought clothes for the poor? When's the last time you visited the sick either in a hospital or a nursing home or the prisoner in prison? When's the last time? And I'd say for many of us here tonight, we might say, you know what? It's been too long it's been too long 
See, my dad thought so when he was reading this text a number of years ago. He told me about it. He said, son, I read Matthew 25, and I just thought, my life doesn't look like that. Like it's saying these things are characteristic of followers of Christ, and they're not characteristic of me, and I know I'm a follower of Christ. This is what he was saying to me. So there in the moment, in that moment, as he read his Bible, which is what Christians should be doing, reading their Bible and responding to what it says, reads his Bible, goes, that, my life doesn't align with that. What does he do? He repents. God, forgive me that I haven't had your heart for the poor, the needy, the prisoner, the sick. Forgive me. What do you want me to do? He told me as he thought about it, he just sensed that the Lord was saying to him, hey, well, just do, you know, do something, <laughs> do something. And so what he decided to do was he picked up a Meals on Wheels route. How many of you guys have heard of Meals on Wheels? Meals on Wheels. It's basically um, something you can serve, be a part of, where you get to deliver meals to people that are homebound, people that can't get out. And so he picked up a route, got the food, and then you go and you deliver it to all these places. And he was delivering it, and he went to this one guy's house, and he, recog and he recognized him. He knew him. He was crippled. His sickness had, had, had severely crippled him. He couldn't really get around anymore. His name was Dyke. And it ended up, he, it was a friend of my dad or an a, a fr acquaintance of my dad's uh, from high school. They weren't, you know, close friends, but he knew him. I mean, and they were able to, to get caught up. But he was a young guy, probably late 40s, and, and had MS, a severe case of multiple uh, sclerosis. So my dad thought, man, this is kind of a divine appointment. And got to keep going back on these routes each week when he delivered food, getting to know uh, Dyke better and ask how he could meet his needs. Well, it turned out Dyke didn't have much family. And so in time, we just adopted him as a part of our family. And we'd go get him and we'd take him to church. And I mean, it, it wasn't just, hey, go, you know, go into his house and say, hey, why don't you come on? I mean, it's like lifting him like me and my dad, one on each side, out of the chair, you, you know, that he was in and into his wheelchair and then to the car. And then we were driving a truck and he had to get him up in the truck. And, and you know, I mean, it, it wasn't easy work. And we'd take him to, to again, church or our house and, and we'd ha have him over for Thanksgiving dinner or, or for Christmas, buy him gifts. Remember for the times he'd come over for dinner, my parents, my mom, or my dad would, would feed him because he had trouble actually even using a fork at that time. And I got to sit there over like a Thanksgiving meal with the poor in our home, watch my parents model for me and my sister what it's like to take care of the poor and respond to the needy. It was very, very impactful to me. In time, uh, Dot gave his life to Christ, got to baptize him. And in the church that we were in, and you can imagine baptizing this guy that, I mean, couldn't help you at all when you're moving him around. So it's like three grown men in the baptistry with this guy, and then get him under and then pull him back out. And I mean, it's just an ordeal. Most beautiful thing you've ever seen, though, for sure. Well, it turned out after that time that he just continued to get worse. His MS was just uh, severe. It continued to, to decline. Couldn't do some of the things he could do before. So I remember one day my dad said, hey, I'm going to, going to visit Dyke. I said, what, what are y'all going to do? And he said, he asked if I would help him take a bath. And I remember initially I thought to myself, that's sick. Like, like that, that's gross. Like, Dad, you're a grown man. He's a grown, crippled man. I'm like, you're going to use gloves. I mean, that, that's kind of that, that's, that's weird. And I felt the Lord in that moment pierce my heart and say to me, hey, Chris, that's what Christians do. Sick things. Gross things or whatever because they, because God's love is in their heart to help the needy in whatever way they need help made a powerful impression on me. Continued to get worse. Ended up in a nursing home. And I remember our family would go up there and we'd sit uh, by his bed there and my dad would read him the scriptures and we'd pray with him. They, parents like to bring him things that he loves so he always wanted, you know, Chick-fil-A ice cream which is from heaven. But anyways, and so uh, ice cream and candy, you know, and all this stuff. There's no telling how much my parents and the time that we were able to spend with him actually spent on him. We visited him in the nursing home, continued to decline, and then eventually he passed away. And I can't help but know that Jesus had my dad on that Mills on Wheels route for a reason. For a reason. And brought Dyke into our family's life for a reason. To give us a heart and a passion and a, a drive to help the poor and the needy. 
And I just was always thinking to myself during this time in my life, you know, if Jesus was here, I bet you this is what he'd be doing. <laughs> From what I read in Scripture, Jesus was here, I bet like what my dad's doing, I bet that's what he'd be doing. The reason meeting needs is so important, it's really not hard to make a case for it. The reason it's so important is because that's what Christians do. Because God's love is in their heart for the things that he has a passion for. One of which is the poor and the needy. So that's why I've asked Clayton to come and share with you guys how we want to meet more needs next year. This is some pretty exciting stuff. Clayton. Well, many of you have heard that our desire, our vision for Experience Life is to be a church that is for the city, uh, that's blessing the city by meeting local needs, by meeting needs in Jesus' name. And if you have, you should have one of these brochures in your chair. You can turn to the meet needs part and you'll be able to kind of follow along and see more about what we're talking about doing through meeting uh, local needs. But we have a plan to meet needs in Jesus' name in our city. And the first way that we want to do that is to take our church-wide projects to the next level. Many of you have participated in one of these over the last year. And um, if you, in case you didn't know, over this last year, we participated a year ago in Crazy Love Christmas, where we were able to take 90 families or a total of 400 people and bless them with Christmas presents, uh, some cars, kitchen appliances, and even kitchen Makeover. So that was through Crazy Love Christmas. Servolution was 10 days of service projects before Easter this year. And we did over 23 total service projects. We had 1,500 volunteers from Experience Life log over 3,300 hours of serving in our community. Through Keep Love It Cool this summer, we were able to bless 20 uh, families who were elderly or poor, couldn't afford uh, air conditioning, and uh, were in danger, at risk. Uh, because of the, the heat this summer, we were able to provide 20 families with, with uh, air conditioning units and handed out over 100 box fans. Uh, through Pack the Pack, this, uh, this fall we were able to, before school, we were able to uh, bless two schools with enough supplies for over 600 students and teachers, including a brand, brand new backpack for every student. And our members spent roughly $25,000 on the supplies and backpacks during that Pack the Pack project. I don't know about you, but is anybody else excited about these projects and what we've seen happen over this last year? And over this next year, we want to see, we want to take these projects, though, to the next level. Through Save the Humans, through our commitment to Save the Humans, we want to take the projects to the next level. One example will be through our Give Big Christmas project. I want you to watch a video and uh, hear from Jill on the way that you can be a part of our Give Big Christmas project. Our Christmas project this year, Give Big, is going to be huge, and I'm so excited to tell you about it. This year, we will be bringing Christmas to two elementary schools, Wheatley and Isles. Both of these wonderful schools were recipients of our school supply drive, and I can't wait to go back and spread a little Christmas cheer to some precious kiddos and some very deserving teachers and employees. In addition to blessing the schools, we have the opportunity to share Christmas with 20 special families. This project is by far the largest project we have ever done. Last year we were able to bless 90 families, which was around 400 people. This year the impact will be even greater as we bring Christmas and God's love to over 1,200 people. But I can't do this alone. I need your help. Simply fill out the card you received when you came in and check which project you would like to participate in and take your card to the Give Big table following the service. There you will receive a packet of information to either adopt a student, a faculty member, or a family and be placed on a team with others just like yourself who are eager to make a difference. We also have a wish tree to choose from where you can help make the wish of someone special come true. Trust me, you don't want to miss out on this extraordinary opportunity to make a huge impact and make this Christmas one you will never forget. It's exciting to see what... See what's going to happen through Give Big. On your way in, you should have gotten a card that looks like this called uh, that says Give Big on the front. If you didn't, they're available on your way out in the, uh, in the entrances to the rink. Uh, but we want you to sign, uh, fill out the card, sign up, take it to the tables uh, in the front foyer where you can sign up to be a part of Give Big uh, for this Christmas. Uh, two schools, 20 families in addition to that, 
total of over 1,200 people that uh, we have a vision, that we have a goal to bless this Christmas. So I want you to be a part of Give Big. Also, this next year, we'll be doing our other church-wide projects, like around the Easter and this summer and for our back-to-school project. We want to take all these projects to the next level, and we can't do that without you, without you partnering with us uh, through your Save the Humans commitment. And also... We want to double our giving. So we want to, we want to do our church-wide projects to the next level, but we also want to double our giving to our local mission partners that are ministering to the poor, to the homeless, uh, to the widow, to the prisoner, to those who are in distress. And I want to tell you just a little bit about each one of the ministries, many ministries, that we will be supporting on a monthly basis uh, starting next year. One of our partners is The Bridge. And the bridge vision is to restore hope to East Lubbock through mentoring middle school and high school students that are at risk. Uh, one student from Estacado named Krista was headed in the wrong direction with the wrong friends and uh, was, was at risk. And through the bridge, uh, she began to change the direction of her life. And uh, during her post-evaluation, after her time with the bridge, she was asked a question that basically said, what is one thing that you've learned in your devotional time that they would have the students do? And her answer totally amazed the staff uh, when she said she learned that he does exist. She was speaking of God. Uh, through her time with the bridge, her life was completely turned around. And she realized that there was a God who loves her. Not only does the bridge uh, work with the uh, at-risk teens, but they also provide food and a clothing program as well. Another one of our partners is Family Coaching. It's an organization that has counseled over 6,000 families in the last 10 years and is currently coaching 90 families with counseling. Mission Lubbock, another one of our partners, provides clothing and food to families in need. They've helped over 3,000 families this last year, and they're helping a hundred, and they've helped 110 families just this last week. They're going through about $2,200 a month just on food for those who are poor or homeless. Pray Lubbock, another one of our partners, led by Steve Dulles, coordinates corporate prayer efforts between churches, Lubbock churches, and pastors. Another one of our partners, Family Promise, offers shelter for homeless families, according to. Family promise one-third of the homeless population are families, and the average age of someone that's homeless in Texas is nine. 300 kids in LISD don't have a place to stay. And they work with over 32 Lubbock congregations and with over 700 volunteers uh, to help these families and to connect families with budget coaches, marriage counselors, and even helping them with job placement. Two weeks before Christmas in 2008, a woman named Brenda and her two kids, Cassie and Chase, found themselves homeless because of a disability. And Brenda couldn't work. She was living off state's uh, funded child support and food stamps. And when it seemed like she had nowhere to turn, she said, Family Promise stepped in just in time for the holidays. They provided her with shelter, food, daycare, and even Christmas presents while this family got back on their feet. Another one of our partners, Texas Boys Ranch, began in 1975. The ranch serves more than, has served more than 800 boys from 120 Texas community, uh, communities that needed a home. The Texas Boys Ranch serves ages uh, 4 to 18, and each boy has provided training in social skills, personal finance, health and safety, home, home economics, community service, and spiritual development in the Christian environment. The boys live in houses, uh, with house parents, and they live on a working, actively working ranch, uh, which means they get the chores of being on an active working ranch. And they're currently housing 21 boys right now. Another one of our partners, Park Ridge Pregnancy Center, began in 1993, and since then, through a combination of counseling and ultrasound, has resulted in nearly 80% of at-risk women having a change of heart from believing that abortion was their only option to choosing life for their baby, which translates into at least 2,500 babies that are alive today because of this ministry. Yep. They've ministered to over 17,000 young women and their families by providing professional services like ultrasounds, pregnancy testing, STD and STI testing and treatments. Um, they've done all these things at no cost. 
Another one of our partners, Kairos Prison Ministry, conducts Bible studies uh, within the Montfort unit, sharing the gospel and leading prisoners to Jesus. Another partner, Buckner's Children's Home, provides shelter, care, food, therapy, life and educational services to children that have been rejected, abandoned, and abused. One story was of a boy named Farish who wrote uh, to back to Buckner's. He was, went into foster care in September of 2001. And he said this, I went because my dad was hitting my sisters and we often all ran away. The adjustment at Buckner's to be at Buckner's was hard at first. I thought everybody was out to get me, but that wasn't true. Buckner's helped me to see there was a way out. And look at me now. I can hold a job and do everything on my own thanks to the preparation for adult living classes at Buckner's. Another one of our partners, Backyard Missions, helps low-income families and the elderly with home repairs that they can't afford to help get their homes warm and dry. They have about a two-year waiting list. They've been going for 18 years. They help about 80 families a year, uh, 80 families a year. And since they started, they've helped over 830 families get their homes warm and dry. Their vision or their motto is repairing homes and restoring hope. And I can tell you from personal experience, having been on the site with many of these homes, uh, partnering with this ministry over the years, it is a powerful experience to be there with these families, to provide this uh, ministry to these families, to pray with these families. To, uh, to, to, it's, just, it's been a powerful experience uh, to work with Backyard Mission just for my, for my own life. Another one of our partners is the Lubbock Dream Center. It's feeding over 100 families every weekend, and for this Thanksgiving, we'll be feeding over 500 families. They also have an after-school program for kids in a clothing ministry. I don't know about you, but are you, are you pumped about what God is doing through these ministries in Lubbock? It's exciting to me uh, that we get to be a part of this. We get to be a part of this. As Chris has said, as we've told you several times, 15% of every dollar that comes in here goes to our local and foreign mission partners. And through being a part of Experience Life, through giving to Experience Life, you're getting to be part of touching and meeting needs in this community. And that's our challenge to you, is to partner with us through Save the Humans to help support our local organizations, bring hope and restoration to this community. So this is, our, this is the plans that we have for us as a church. And Chris is going to be telling you about ways that you can personally be involved. You'll help me thank Clayton for sharing. It's great. So how you can help, like how you can be a part. If you're saying, dude, that is, that is awesome. Yeah, like I'd like to be a part of that. Well, let me ask you this question. What is it exactly that the poor need? What do they need? They need money or things that money can buy, right? Like food, clothing, shelter. The Bible says this, wherever your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Meaning the things that you spend your money on, those are the things that you have a heart for. So a great way to know that you've got a heart for the poor is that you give proportionally and consistently to help them. Proportionally and consistently. Proportionally first, like proportionally like a percentage. Like as God blesses you, you return a portion to him for the advancement of the gospel and to help those less fortunate than you. Like, like a percentage. Because here's what most people do and what I, I'd done for a long time and was convicted about is like when you see the Salvation Army guy outside of Dillard's and you ring the bell and you drop five in, you're like, I feel good about myself today. That's so great. And you see a guy, he needs, he needs a meal, so you buy McDonald's and, and you do a couple of things. But here, here's what I don't think we realize is that you add all those up at the end end of the year it equals almost zero percent of your income and I think by anybody's standard if you're just being objective that wouldn't equal a real heart for the poor because you're not giving in proportion to how God's blessed you like a percentage it's just kind of kind of like every now and then if, if, if I can and I bought everything that I want for myself See, you see this all throughout the Bible. The Jews in the Old Testament, this was required, actually, uh, of them. They would give a tenth, 10% to their, uh, to, to their spiritual leaders, the equivalent of, of today's church. They give 10% to a festival and 3% to the poor orphan and widow. How, how much is that total? 23% required of them at least, and then they gave free will offerings above and beyond because God wanted his people to be generous. An article I found said this, Jewish teachers developed extensive guidelines concerning charitable giving. Every member of the community was required to give to the needy. Listen to this. Even the poor were expected to help those less fortunate than themselves. Sometimes people who refused to give were flogged publicly. 
beaten publicly. A portion of their property could even be seized and donated to charity. Normally, Jews gave at least a tenth, 10% of their wealth to charity. 3% required, wanted to give above and beyond because God had blessed them. The question really that I think that follows logically from this is does God require less of the wealthy Christian than he did of the poorest Jew? I'll ask that again because I've asked myself that. Does God require less of the wealthy Christian, which is most of us, than he did of the poorest Jew? Some people are like, well, here's the thing. We're under grace. Yeah, under grace the standard is raised, not lowered. If you read your New Testament. Jesus said, you heard it was said, don't commit adultery. But I say to you, if you lust, you commit adultery in your heart. Bar is raised. Standard is raised, not lowered. So proportionally and consistently, not like, you know, every now and then if I feel like it, but like on a regular basis, helping the poor. They're struggling, some of which don't have anything to eat, a place to sleep, or clothes to wear. Yet obviously most of us have those things. You know, this is what we do at Experience Life, like Clayton said. We give proportionally and consistently to spread the gospel and help the poor. We give 15% away from the very beginning with plans to increase that. If we meet our Save the Humans goal, guess what? We'll be able to double it. So some of y'all are like, okay, so let me, let me get this. Let me, let me get it. Tell me if I'm getting this right. So y'all are raising money to give some of it away. Because that would be weird. I didn't think you did that in a fundraiser. I thought you raised it for yourself. Y'all, y'all are raising money, and you're saying you're going to raise some money, and you're going to then give it away. That's, that's kind of how we roll at Experience Life. 15% of everything that's raised is going to be given away. Be double what we would be able to do in a normal year. That's just, that's just, that's just what we do. We want to be radically generous at Experience Life. So I think Save the Humans for a lot of people is a great opportunity to get proportional and consistent if you recognize you're not there now. Let me tell you about a couple of ways you can be a part of this. If you'll open up your brochure and look at the back, all we've been asking people to do, no pressure. This is a no pressure project. It's just if you want to, if God leads you to. We're just at least asking you, challenging you to pray. Say, God, what do you want me to do? Here's the problem. Some people don't like to pray because they know God's going to tell them to do something. All right? So we're challenging them, though, to pray. Ask God what he wants you to do. But I explained this last week, so I'm not going to go into detail. But on the back here, there's three options, three ways we're challenging people to get proportional and consistent. First is I'm going to begin giving a certain amount per month. Per month, that's consistent. And then you can give a percentage of your income. That'd be proportional, like 3%, 5%. Maybe you, you're not giving anything. You want to start giving something, 3%, 5%. You can put that total in there. That's what I want to do. That's what you can, if that's, if that's you saying that. Second option, I'm going to begin tithing 10%, which is a certain amount per month. The Bible says this is very important, and I think if you're a Christian, if you're a Christ follower, you need a plan. If you're not there now, you need a plan to get there quickly. Just saying that from Scripture, okay? So that may be the option for some of you. That's, that's proportional. That's 10% and then consistent per month. Third option, I'm going to give above and beyond my tithe a certain amount per month. Give above and beyond a certain amount per month. I told you about Emily and I last week desiring once we got married to, to begin giving more each year and tried to increase our giving by 1% each year. I challenge some of you that are already tithing, already at the 10%. Why not, why not try that? Why not try 1% each year? Because here's what's cool. Think about this. Think about if you're a tither and you give 1% more each year for 15 years, where do you land? 25%, right? Can you imagine the joy, the blessing in being able to give a fourth of your income away, be able to live well on the rest to the poor, to people that are struggling overseas to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do you know how much of a blessing that would be? See, we don't think that way a lot. Man, that's, that's the most exciting thing you can do with your money. So, just challenging you to pray about it. Here's the deal. Some of you guys heard this talk last week, heard the talk we gave last week about this. And you're already ready. You're like, I don't even need to pray about it anymore. I already know what I want to do. Here's the deal. Commitment weekend, we've said is next weekend where we'll, we're going to take commitment cards. But I know some people, our staff and some of you, are already ready. You've prayed about it. God's led you to do something here. Here's what we're going to do as the band plays. We're going to have staff members on either side of the stage. And you can bring up your card to them, hand it to them. And then what they're going to do is they'll hand you one of these bands. You can see on my arm here, it's an orange band. It says Save the Humans as a reminder of the commitment you're making. And so that you can tell people that ask about the band what's going on at the church and what this whole Save the Humans project is about. But the reason I've asked the staff to come up on either side is because, man, I'm telling you, these guys are givers. 
They made a sacrifice with Vision 2010, Save the Humans. They're on fire. I've encouraged them to lead by example. We're not going to ask you to do something we're not going to do ourselves. So they'll be up here on either side of the stage. If you're already ready, you're like, I'm fired up. I'm fired up. You can bring this card up here, hand it to them. They'll give you a band. If you still want more time to pray about it, we'll collect them next weekend as well. Two other ways. Two other ways, additionally, that you can help us to meet needs. One, get involved in a life house. They do one service project every semester. We've got 56 life houses meeting. That's almost three service projects a week happening in the semester. It's awesome. Get involved a second. Get involved in one of our church-wide projects like Give Big. Be great. And fill out the card and take it to the back. But I just pray. I'm challenging you to pray about how God wants you to, to be a part. One verse and then we're done. Proverbs 21.13 says this. Those who shut their ears to the cries of the poor will be ignored in their own time of need. May it never be said in experienced life that we shut our ears to the cries of the poor, but may the poor in our city know that we love them, that we care about them, and that we'll do everything in our power to meet their needs in Jesus' name. Anybody with me on that? Anybody with me? Let's pray together. Jesus, thank you so much for my friends that are here tonight. God, some of us just need to repent. <laughs> we don't have a heart for the poor. Who are we kidding? But yet that should be our heart if God's love is in us, according to Scripture. Thank you for my dad setting the example for me and reading the Scriptures, recognizing his life didn't align with him, and repenting, and doing something about it. And God, I just pray that you challenge the people here to pray about how you'd have them to be involved and save the humans. Some people here, they know they need to get proportional and consistent. They just do. God, I pray that you give them the boldness to do that. Thank you for my friends, God. Thank you that they love strong challenges from your word, and they're always so faithful to respond. In Jesus' name, amen. I want you to stand right where you're at. Staff is on either side of the stage. If you're already ready, God's already told you what to do. You can take this card. Here on the left, take it to them. They'll give you a band. If you need another week to pray about it, we'll do it again next weekend. But as the band plays and God leads, you respond. Thanks for checking out one of our messages today. If you made a decision to commit your life to Christ, I'd love to know about it. You can email me at chris at experiencelifenow.com. Also, if you're interested in taking a next step, check out our website at experiencelifenow.com and click on Next Steps. Let us know if we can ever serve you in any way, and we look forward to seeing you soon.